Hi, good afternoon to everyone watching in the USA. Uh, und einen schönen guten Abend an diejenigen, die aus Deutschland zuschauen. Uh, my name is Dean Whiteside, and on behalf of the Goethe Institute New York and Executive Director Dr. Jörg Schumacher, I'd like to welcome you to this special conversation between Philip Bame and Dr. Shelley Frisch. And this is a, a celebratory occasion because Philip Bame has been selected as the winner of the 2020 Helen und Kurt Wolf Translators Prize for his translation of the novel, The Fox and Dr. Shimamura uh, by uh, Christina Wunneke, uh, which was published by New Directions last year. Here's a cover of the book. And uh, I hope Christina is tuning in uh, live from Germany. If you're there, Christina, hallo, guten Abend, grüß dich. And uh, with this prize, the, uh, we had a ceremony planned on June 4th, which unfortunately due to the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic has been postponed to next uh, spring, uh, at which point we still hope to uh, invite Philip uh, to New York City to celebrate his work. Uh, so today is not a substitute for an official ceremony. It's a much more uh, intimate uh, conversation between Philip uh, and Shelley to explore the art of, of translation. Uh, so good to see you, Philip and Shelley. Uh, where are you and how are you doing today? Which one of us would you like to have? Why don't, why don't you go ahead, Shelley? Okay. Well, greetings from Princeton, New Jersey, which is one of the hottest of the hot spots of coronavirus. Uh, luckily, we're fine so far, but shut in. Um, it's wonderful to see Philip again. The last time we met was in at the Frankfurt Book Fair, seems almost quaint at this point, um, in, uh, in 2019, um, where we were at a gathering of translators from around the globe who translate from German into their native languages. And um, I think of that era as the BC era, meaning before coronavirus. Um, and uh, it does seem very far away. So in some ways everything's changed, but everything has remained the same uh, for translators who are typically holed up in their houses, um, translating all day. Uh, our daily routine, uh, I don't know if this is the same for you, Philip, but for me, um, my daily routine uh, is still based on being in the house and, and translating all day, and I continue to do that. Um, now the rest of the world is joining us in that, um, in that isolation. So they get to see close up what, um, what the daily routine of a translator is. Um, luckily for us wolf jurors, I would just like to add, uh, some things haven't changed. Each year we get a chance to read some wonderful translations uh, from German into English that have been published in the US the previous year. And this year was no exception in that regard. Um, and um, Philip uh, uh, was represented by not one, but three titles. And we'll talk about that uh, in a minute. Um, and uh, although the ceremony itself is postponed till next spring, I hope that today's discussion will be a chance to celebrate right now. I have a bottle of wine ready to open here in Texas, um, which is where I'm calling from, or dialing in from, Zooming from. Uh, Zoom is a, a word we hear a lot of in Houston with all the space business, but this is a different type. Uh, no, so I'm doing okay. Uh, yes, Shelley, I do spend a lot of time working at home. And for those of us who have been working at home for a long time, there isn't too much change. I'm also a theater director. So there's a huge change in that, in that universe. Um, so, uh, but we're um, cautiously optimistic that some day we will reopen the theater where I, uh, which I run in St. Louis. So. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. And to our viewers on Zoom and also on Facebook Live, uh, I'd like to direct your attention to the chat feature at the bottom of the screen. This is on Zoom. Uh, there will be a Q&A that follows the discussion and Philip's reading. But please ask questions, make comments throughout the chat. 
Uh, don't wait until the end. We have Erin Cox, who's here, moderating the chat, and she'll compile your questions. Uh, and you could also mention when you ask the question if you would like to be unmuted or if you would prefer for Erin to read your question. Uh, and to all those watching live on Facebook, hi, good to see you. We'd love to hear from you as well. So let us know where you're watching from. Type your questions and comments, and uh, Aaron will be monitoring that uh, as well. So just a little background about the Wolf Prize. Uh, this was established in 1996, and it's been administered by the Goethe Institute in New York since 2015. The Goethe Institute is the cultural institute of the Federal Republic of Germany with a global reach of 159 locations. We promote knowledge of the German language abroad and foster international cultural cooperation. The uh, Wolf Prize is given each spring to award an outstanding translation from German into English published in the USA in the previous year. So this year we had 21 books uh, submitted by major American publishers, all books published in 2019. And uh, I heard from Shelley that it was an exciting challenge for our five member jury, which she led uh, to whittle those titles first down to a short list of four translators and five texts, uh, two of which were by Philip, as Shelley mentioned, including his translation of Darkness at Noon by Arthur Kustler. I read it this week, incredible, mm -hmm. uh, harrowing. Yeah. And uh, finally to select the winner. Uh, and I think this year was an especially diverse selection of titles, spatting nonfiction, uh, short stories, over 600 years of German language literature. Um, the jury members consisted of Shelley, uh, the chair, then Bettina Ababanel, John Hargraves, Susan Harris, and Damien Searles. And if some of you are watching, hi to you also. Uh, and I should mention that in addition to all being esteemed translators and writers, uh, several of these jury members are themselves prior recipients of the Wolf Prize, including Shelley, John Hargraves, and Damien Searles. Uh, so I think Aaron is going to send you uh, a link to our Wolf Prize website, which has a list of all of this year's submitted titles, which you can browse, uh, and also a nice archive of previous winners, which is a, a nice resource. That's at the bottom of the uh, page Aaron's about to send you. Uh, should say that we are grateful to the German Auswärtiges Amt, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, for their support and for making this prize possible. Uh, and I'd like to play now a, a short video, which was recorded uh, in New York City this week, by the uh, Consul General David Gill. Let's see if I can figure this out. Ladies and gentlemen, lieber Herr Böhm, lieber Herr Schumacher, dear all. Ich bin David Gill, der deutsche Generalkonsul hier in New York. Und first of all, dear Mr. Böhm, Herzlichen Glückwunsch and congratulations on the well-deserved award. I would have loved to shake your hand and toast you in person today, aber ich bin zuversichtlich, das werden wir eines Tages nachholen. The COVID crisis teaches us patience and also new words and phrases like social distancing or essential workers. I'm convinced that you, Mr. Böhm, belong to those essential workers. For me, artists, and especially artists of language, like translators and writers, are essential for the common good. They do what politicians and diplomats often strive to do, but not always accomplish. They bridge gaps between cultures and languages. Writers and translators spark imagination, take us to different countries, connect us to different people, help us to travel through times. They make us aware of the complexity of human relations and 
open our hearts to embrace our common humanity, even in the loneliest times. Ich gratuliere herzlich zum Helen and Kurt Wolf Preis. So uh, just a few words about the plan for today. Uh, we'll start with our discussion between uh, Shelley and Philip. Uh, around 3.35 or so, this will be followed by uh, Philip's reading from the Fox and Dr. Shimamura. Uh, and around 3.45 New York time, we'll open things up for questions and conversation, but don't forget, start typing now whenever uh, something comes into your mind. And uh, Christina, if you're around, I hope you'll say hi to us. We could even uh, activate your microphone and video. We'd love to hear from you and uh, see you uh, in Germany. So, to introduce our speakers, Shelley Frisch, our jury chair, taught at Columbia for years before becoming a full-time translator. She's translated a number of award-winning biographies, including the book Kafka, The Years of Insight by Rainer Stach, which received the 2014 Wolf Prize. Philip Bame is one of today's foremost literary translators. He's now the only translator, in fact, I should mention to have been awarded the Wolf Prize twice. The last time was in uh, the year 2013. I think I have a photo. Our colleague in, uh, Denise in Chicago found this photo. That was you in Chicago in 2013. What, what was that you translated that, that year, Philip? That was an ermine in Chernopol by Gregor von Rezzori. That was uh, in 2013. Mm -hmm. I was beardless. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> uh, inhaling from Houston, Texas, Philip is a translator, playwright, and theater director who has translated primarily German and Polish literature, including canonical translations of novels by Ingeborg Bachmann, Hertha Müller, and Hannah Kral. Uh, he's received numerous awards, including fellowships from the NEA and the Guggenheim Foundation, his translations managed to capture a fidelity and transparency to the original text to paradoxically both disappear and speak with a confident, sensitive, and unmistakable voice of his own. Thank you so much for joining us today, Philip. Please accept our warmest congrats from the Goethe Institute New York, and I'll turn it over now to you and Shelley. Thank you so much for having me here, and uh, thank you. I'd like to also begin with thanking uh, the jury as well as all who participate, because I know there's a lot of people working behind the scenes to make this event happen. So thank you all. Um, and I'll turn to Shelley. Okay. We'll jump right into the discussion. Um, so I'd just like to read a rather lengthy but um, fact-filled question for you to kick things off. Um, last year was quite a banner year for you um, in publishing translations from German. Uh, three highly acclaimed projects were submitted by your publishers. Uh, the Christina Wonicke Von novel that we'll be discussing today, and we'll certainly come back to that right away. Uh, a new translation of Arthur Kirstler's Darkness at Noon, and an updated translation of a book you yourself translated a couple of decades ago, namely Ingeborg Bachmann's Malina. I gather you weren't working on all three of these simultaneously, um, but congratulations are still in order for a stellar 2019. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your work on uh, the other two books, Kressler's Darkness at Noon and Bachmann's Molina before we dive into the heart of our discussion? Sure. Um, wondering what it was like, for example, for you to retranslate yourself. <laughs> well, that was like meeting a ghost um, because that, that was like running into yourself uh, on the street and realizing, well, yes, you had said these things and you had probably written those lines, but somehow you have to own up to it. There wasn't too much I, I would have changed had it not been for the fact that in the meanwhile, we have a lot more information about Ingeborg Bachmann, a lot more information about that particular book. And we also can get online and find out these things. Um, the I would sit at the library, there's a new critical edition of the Bachmann, and so I discovered, for instance, that an entire passage, uh, which I had rendered uh, earlier, just in a fairy tale-like manner, 
uh, that she had lifted that from an English language source. And there had been a translated version into German that she had used. So that was, um, that was an interesting exercise. There was a lot of combing over uh, research and, and just trying to, to find where she had, she had so many references. I mean, this was a woman who, who was enormously um, expert in so many areas and she, literary uh, allusions that, that have been decoded. I'm still, I'm certain that there are several that remain undecoded, uh, but those, uh, the critical edition helped there. Uh, the Darkness at Noon book, um, that was a, an, an odd uh, case because for years, Kessler had finished that when uh, Paris and the German army was, was coming in and he had to leave and he had been living with his girlfriend and the girlfriend had been translating as he wrote in German, she had been translating and then they had to leave and she sent this translation off to British publishers. He sent a copy to his publisher, uh, grabbed his manuscript, and, but in the commotion, that manuscript was lost and the other one they thought was lost too, the other, the copy. But a few years ago, a, a graduate student was in the archives of a publishing house in Switzerland and discovered this original manuscript. So that called for a new translation. There were some things that had been edited out of the uh, English, the first English translation, which has served us very well for decades, by the way. Um, but it was enough to warrant a new, uh, a new translation, which Scribner did. And here I'd also like to say uh, two of these books, Christina Wunicke's book and Ingeborg Bachmann's are published by New Directions. And we, we, we owe uh, publishers like New Directions uh, a, a huge uh, vote of thanks because they are the ones who determine, you know, they take these books from these other languages and uh, hire us to, to, to present them in English. And uh, that's not always, it's, it's a rare thing to have a publisher so dedicated. And uh, the editors in general that I've been fortunate to work with have been wonderful people. Um, uh, Drink of Ilm, Sarah Burstell, and at New Directions, uh, Barbara Epler, who is um, just a stellar editor and a steadfast friend of translation. Thank you. Um, so you've translated from Polish, from German, and I gather also from Spanish. Um, I won't even get into the rattling off the list of titles, uh, but I did, I couldn't help but notice that two of them even have the word fox in the title. So you certainly have yeah, a, a wide a range. Fox, a lot of fox happening over here. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a foxy list, yes. Um, could you tell us um, how you came to translation, just very briefly, um, and, um, and why these languages? Well, it was by accident. I think a lot of us fall into translating by accident, um, knowing the, the, I think few people <laughs> would actively choose it from as a career choice when they're in eighth grade. You say, what do you want to be when you grow up? I want to be a translator and make very little money and work long hours. Um, well, I wanted to be a lexicographer, so go now. Okay. <laughs> no, that's, uh, no, I was uh, directing plays in Poland. I was in New York uh, for a little bit at that time. You couldn't take Polish currency out. The, the non-transferable Zlotys, what they were called. And besides, even if you could, they, they weren't worth anything in, in the West. And um, my friend uh, Mark Anderson uh, suggested that I submit a sample uh, to this publishing house that was going to uh, publish an English version of Ingeborg Bachmann's Marina. And so that was the first Holmes book I- Holmes and Meyer. Holmes and Meyer, right. Mm -hmm. And um, so I submitted the sample, they chose that. And then it was a difficult book. Once the book came out, I started getting uh, offers and um, that's kind of how I got started. Okay, excellent. Um, so um, when I think of how translators and projects match up, um, to me they seem to fall into two categories, the translators that is, the, um, the proactive and the reactive translators as I like to think of them. The proactive translators are those who pitch books to editors and, and place them with uh, publishing houses with any luck and the reactive ones, um, that's the camp I'm in, um, for better or worse, but that's where I am um, in terms of my history as a translator. And I, th I think you mentioned that you're similarly located um, where uh, publishers have already acquired a book, seek, seek a translator, and then request that you translate that book, at which point you, get, you say yes or no to that particular project. Um, so I was wondering- Most of the time. Um, what's that? 
most of the time. Uh, there have been a few exceptions where I've taken books to the publishers, um, uh, particularly some Polish uh, books. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, um, so I, I, I found for myself the uh, serendipity of this process of, of reacting to books offered me quite interesting. I've mm -hmm. um, translated books on, you know, uh, books I didn't know existed on uh, Germany's most famous condom manufacturer, for example, <laughs> a book on um, Unix wow. and Castrati, and most recently, a uh, scary topic, um, and most recently uh, about a prolonged war between two uh, rival zoos. Um, wow. So you, you get to learn quite a bit about the world through this lens. Um, could you uh, tell us how you came to translate the book that we're celebrating today, uh, Christina Vonica's uh, The Fox and Dr. Shimamura. That's all thanks to Barbara Epler of New Directions, who approached me and said, we have this book. Um, why don't you read it? Tell us what you think. And, um, and I said, wow, that's, yes, let's go. And so that's how I, that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. The, um, when we started, uh, it's, I think Barbara doesn't read German, but she know, she knew all about the book, and uh, it it is typical of New Directions to explore different genres as well as different languages, um, and so this is a very New Directions kind of a book uh, in that regard. Um, but that's that's how it it came to me, just uh, a direct, hey, I think you might be interested in this, and uh, what do you think? Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's pretty much the path that most of my translations take as well. Um, and um, then uh, you start translating the book. Could you tell us, you know, you read this book through, all of us jurors read it at least twice because um, it's not the uh, most straightforward narrative. It's got an <laughs> unusual no. narrative thrust, I think it's fair to say. No, no. Um, and I was wondering um, what challenges you faced along the way. Uh, the, the, the fact that there's, it's based on a, a, on a true life story, but um, it's fictionalized in many ways. I don't know if that combination was, was uh, a special challenge for you or whether the unreliable narrator posed some questions or this, the various settings or wherever you want to Come in. I, I hope that Christina is, is listening to this because um, she should be laughing. It's, it's, it's a very, it, there are lots of little tricks in this book, a very kind of uh, like sly, we might say, uh, approach to writing. And there are so many historical references. There are phrases lifted from um, like Griesinger's uh, uh, pathology. Uh, you know, a big, a, a very important text for the medical profession back then. The protagonist visits Charcot in Paris. And we know, of course, all about Charcot in Paris and all these people that worked with Charcot, like uh, Tourette and Babinski, all figure in this book. Um, and so there, there's so much, it is so embedded in historical reality that I had to research that reality quite extensively. And I enjoy doing this. In fact, it's a, it's, it slows the translation because you get so distracted, it's so fascinating. Uh, but then you have a uh, fox demon possession suddenly appearing and well, but it turns out there that maybe that's real too. Uh, that certainly Dr. Shimamura, the protagonist was a real person and there, there's a lot of, of, of play here. It's a very playful book uh, trying to uh, figure out how much, where that anchor is deeply embedded in reality and where the, the sands have shifted a little bit it is, was, uh, that took some, 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 some work. Um, but yes, that took a lot of, it, it, and it, it travels, he, we have to travel with him across uh, borders and times different. Uh, there's, there's Paris, there's Berlin, there's Vienna, and of course there's Japan before these travels and after when he's an older man. So all of that took a lot of uh, research as, as well as just Im imagination, trying to figure out what, what would that be like? What was, when Christina Bunica says in German, he's drinking a cup of coffee, say in Alexandria, is it a tiny demi what, what is it? You know, what, 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 are, what do these things look like? What do they feel like? What's the temperature in the room 
in Paris. Uh, all of that informs us, I think, when, when we're uh, recasting this book in English. Mm -hmm. uh, well, of course, that leads very uh, cleanly into the question of how you worked with your author. Um, and remember, she's here and listening. <laughs> so, yeah, I, um, I just mean it. <laughs> could you tell us about the process of how you um, got to know one another as as co-creators of this translated text on some level? Well, it was uh, thanks to, again to, to Barbara Epler uh, for for connecting. First of all, connecting me with the book, and then there were invariably some questions. Um, and Christine was very responsive to any any questions. I also had uh, the great fortune of uh, a, a, a Lufthansa well not accident a Lufthansa uh, lateness shall we say put me in Munich an extra day. I was stuck in Munich overnight, and I thought, who do I know in Munich? And then I thought, called up Christina, and she said, get on the train, come in, let's have a beer, and we 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 had a great meeting in Munich, uh, <laughs> unforeseen. So that was um, that was already after uh, after the book had been pretty much done. But it was wonderful to meet her, and then we talked about some of these uh, some of the playful uh, wrinkles in in the book. Uh, so, but but she answered all my questions, and sometimes she said, "Well, you know, maybe it's uh, I, I, it was a while back when I wrote it." So <laughs> you could go either way. <laughs> I was hoping you maybe converse with her about this earlier in the process to reap some of the benefits of clearly the considerable research she had put into writing it. Well, we did, we did indeed uh, talk about that. And, uh, and it, 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 it's interesting because some of the books that she uses, that she quotes in the German edition came out, but when they came out in, Engl in, in English uh, at the end of the 19th century, they were abridged. They were not just translated, they were also abridged. And so it was a matter of finding language that was from those. So I was quoting from this, the English edition of, say, Griesinger, um, and trying to find phrases that were like the ones that she had found in, in the German, in the full German edition uh, of those works. Um, here also, sometimes just to get a flavor, uh, it happens that my grandfather was a physician and there were some books in, from his library uh, floating around, like, for instance, this one, uh, which I show and tell. Um, and this is from 1897, Therapy of the Vienna Clinics. And, and you can just, it, it's just so, you can, such a, such a different linguistic approach. And so I was reading some of the things like that just to get the flavor of, of some of those uh, medical terms. Uh, but uh, I was hoping that, um, I would get to travel to Japan, but the Goethe Institute and New Directions didn't 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 send me to Japan to do the research there. And then I could have perhaps done personal research on fox demons, but that that still awaits us. I think. Mm -hmm. Well, that'll be a sequel, perhaps. Yeah. Um, you evidently have a book coming out uh, translated from Polish uh, next month. Do you want to tell us a word or two about that? Uh, yes, that's World Editions in Amsterdam, uh, and that is uh, called Mała Zagłada in Polish. It, it's a little annihilation in the English title. Um, it's a much less playful book. It's really about epigenetic trauma. Um, the author's mother was uh, nine years old when um, these uh, German uh, soldiers and auxiliaries uh, came into her little village in uh, southeast Poland and um, uh, destroyed uh, the village and murdered most of the inhabitants and it was a pacification of the village. Um, so the author grew up with this mother who had experienced that as, as a child and, and the author is in dialogue with the mother about um, that inherited trauma. Um, so it's a, uh, a very different kind of book. <laughs> very different kind of book, right. And I think at this point we'll turn our attention back to the, the book of the day, um, mm -hmm. which is Christina Vonica's uh, The Fox and Dr. Shimamura, and have you read uh, the, the passage that you've selected to entertain and delight us with. Okay, let me... Uh, so I'm, I'm going to start at the beginning and then jump to a smaller to another section. 
The fever came right on time toward the end of winter. And once again, Shunichi Shimamura, professor emeritus for the treatment of nervous disorders, contemplated the varied paths of life. For such reflection, he preferred German, and inside his brain, that language spun complicated webs, which gradually turned into a tangle of increasingly agitated thoughts. Dr. Shimamura suffered from consumption, and perhaps from some additional affliction for which he could not find a suitable name in German, or Japanese, or Chinese, or even in the gibberish of the medical professions. Inside his house in Kameoka, he sat stock still in the rattan chair between his desk and a fern set in a small metal urn with a faux patina, staring at the window without his glasses. The late light of winter, it was the end of February, 1922, mixed with the early light of spring, giving the window paper a yellowish tinge. Perhaps his fever would soon climb so high that his mind would become completely muddled. He'd better go to bed before that happened, he thought, but only just before, since lying down is hardly a reliable antidote to life. That's the beginning, and the book then takes us back in time to when Shimamura was a young doctor under the tutelage of a famous uh, Japanese uh, psychiatrist named Hajimi Sakaki, also a historical figure, who sends Shimamura to the Shimane Prefecture to study the annual epidemic of Kitsunetsuki or fox demon possession, which primarily afflicts women. So. In the ensuing chapters, uh, Shimamura sets off with a young man he calls the student, and they travel from village to village examining women who are, are said to be possessed, but which have in fact an array of symptoms of diseases that Shimamura diagnoses as a medical doctor. But then one day they come to the home of a wealthy fishmonger who has a daughter named Kiyo. And this daughter also has been displaying some symptoms and symptoms that quite startled Shimamura. Kiyo's back began to rise and fall. Her breathing grew deeper, then faster and faster, thumping like an insect. Pardon us, she said in a strained whisper, still bowing, and then shot her head straight up into the air rolled back and screamed, howled, first a sharp yap, then a throaty baying that wouldn't stop. For such a small person, her lungs could evidently hold an amazing amount of air. Still on her knees, she arched backwards, bending over in a kind of reverse bow until her head was nearly touching the floor mat, only on the wrong side. The screaming did not let up. All the women, closed their mouths and covered their noses and ran out. Shimamura had jumped to his feet. He stood there and watched. With her backwards half somersault, Kiyo had exposed most of her upper body and he could not help looking at the white skin stretched over her ribs and at two tiny dark nipples that seemed to have slipped alarmingly close to her neck. Her whole body seemed to have slipped out of joint. Her shoulders and elbows had shifted into places that human anatomy could not foresee. And where were her hands? Were they clenched inside the hollows of her knees, bent backwards at the knuckles? Was she now going to turn herself inside out like a glove? Shimamura did not try to help her. Her face flushed a deep red, her neck was distended, and as she rolled over sideways, still screaming, her sash started coming unwound. Under her kimono, a beautiful pale colored girl's kimono adorned with an appropriate fish pattern, he noticed several tightly wound bandages. The household probably expected her to lose her dress in the course of the day and therefore made sure her underparts were well wrapped every morning. The throaty yapping, tipped back into a shrill yip 
then began to quiver and finally faded off in a deep wheeze. Keo stretched out her neck. Her eyes rolled back. For a hopeful moment, Shimamura had the impression a classic tonic seizure was about to occur as part of a normal epileptic contortion, but instead Keo lay down on her side, pulled her feet neatly under the hem of her kimono, propped her cheek on her hand, and looked at Shimamura straight in the face, exhausted and a little reproachful, as if all this debilitating commotion were his fault. Dr. Shimamura found himself exclaiming, please come help your daughter, but the words came out small and hoarse, and no one came. Go on, said Keo mildly, have a look. She rolled over on her back and took off more clothing. She went so far as to gather the bandages together a bit, just below her hips, to the beginning of her pubic hair, and pulled the fish pattern wide apart, exposing her thighs. And there came the fox. Thank you. Thank you, Philip, for that. I see Christina here. And uh, Christina, I'm going to try to uh, unmute your microphone and uh, turn your video on. So hopefully you can join us and say hi. Hi. Does this work? Yeah. Hi, Christina. Hi, Philip. Hi, Christina. Hi. <laughs> Great to see you. Congratulations. Well, thank my, you. My connection is a bit wobbly here. It's the fox spirits possessing your connection, I think. Yeah, it's yapping and yipping. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But maybe we'll get... I'm just trying to turn your video on, Christina. Did right. you Did you see that? Is it working? No, I don't see any. I'm I'm a real loser with with this thing. <laughs> I just see a yes. I see no video. No. It's okay. No worries. We can hear you just fine. Okay, that's okay. I don't. I'm I'm not sure. I'm just happy to see you, and uh, I congratulate Philip. Well, and thank you, and, and thank you for sharing this wonderful book with us. <laughs> oh, very welcome. Mm -hmm. Don't know why my thing doesn't work. How did you like it uh, in English, Christina? Did it sound good to you? Yes, wonderful. Well, he's such a has such a musical language, a great rhythm. I, I liked it a lot. It's a wonderful translation. Yeah, thank you so much. That's very kind. Of Thanks, you. Christina. Hey, Shelley, you're back. I'm back. So I'm going right now to unmute uh, our co-host, Erin. Erin uh, Cox is here, and uh, she has some uh, questions from uh, our audience that she will read to both, uh, both Philip and Shelley. Yes, uh, this first question is from, uh, and I, I'm going to apologize um, if I mispronounce your, your names, but the first question is from Ruth Krozik. Uh The question is, uh, I think to, the, to you, Shelley, uh, do you ever receive any children's or young adult translation submissions for the Wolf Prize? It's happened, but it's rare. Um, it's always up to the discretion of the publisher what to submit and what not to submit. Sometimes we find that a bit frustrating that they don't submit a greater range of their publications. But um, again, we, we're on the reactive side. We, uh, we uh, solicit submissions and hope that there will be a great range. It's been rare, though. I don't remember any children's books. There have been uh, some young adult books, though. Thanks for the question. Our next question is from Ed, Edna Biesold. Uh, can translators just pick a piece of literature and send it to publishers when finished, or do they need the rights first before a publisher will look at their translation? Um, it's best to uh, inquire about the rights um, because you could find yourself in a position that you've translated something and then the uh, the original house that holds those rights or the author uh, may have other plans or may have sold those rights to someone and it would be a shame to put a, invest a lot of work into something and then find that you did not have the rights. So it's always best to 
to investigate the right situation before launching into a project. Mm -hmm. and, and there's also the issue that possibly that book is under contract with another uh, English language publisher and, um, and your work um, would not be in a position to be published after all that work, which would be a uh, shame. Our next question is from Diana Ranker, who is uh, watching us from Auckland, New Zealand. And she says, Philip, congratulations and thank you for speaking to us. I would like to know whether your translation process, the way you work, has changed fundament fundamentally in the last few years with new technologies available to assist the translation process. Are there any tools you use in the process and for reviewing your work? The way technology has changed the way I work is primarily uh, access to research online and I can um, I can read about uh, the real uh, Shimamura online and I can access and in fact I was able to access a Japanese uh, medical journal that, that Christina Bunica quotes um, <laughs> rather slyly and um, then I had I don't read Japanese but I was able to to access that thanks to uh, being able to research these things online. There's a lot of digital content that, you know, libraries have been uh, digitizing their content. So that, that made a lot of these uh, old medical texts also available. Um, I don't use any type of uh, translation assistance, none, none of that, but the, but the research is it, facilitated. So uh, that, that really saves a lot of time. Also, I, I do use, there are several online dictionaries that, um, I use, uh, and it used to be, um, you know, moving very heavy dictionaries around on a translator desk. It's, my desk is unfortunately quite cluttered anyway, um, but if, if I had those big dictionaries around, that'd be, um, I, I would have a hard time finding a, a place to put the, my laptop. <laughs> which is so, uh, so I think that answers the, the question. May I just add, uh, ditto to the above. Um, I don't know if I'm tuned in now. Yes, um, sure. you know, ditto to the above. And also um, you get to information much more rapidly by the ability to type in a phrase uh, that you're wondering about and, and see what comes up. Um, for example, uh, before Google, uh, if I was told by a German author that something was written by Darwin and all I had in front of me was a translation into German, of a phrase from what book I don't know. Um, it saves many hours of scouring through Darwin's collected works to try to locate these kinds of things. Um, you can put in what you assume was the, uh, was the original wording and see what pops up. And then uh, you can get to your source material much more, much more readily. I also don't use translation software at all. I, I think it might be very useful for technical translation, but that's not an area that I work in. Our next question is from Jeff Howes, who asks um, if there were any stylistic Japaneseism or Jap Japanisms, sorry, uh, in the German that you had to render into English. Well, that's very interesting. Uh, the, what um, there are some uh, Japan the Japanisms um, in the English that are not in the German because. The German has certain things that I can't render into English very easily, such as the uh, constant problem of uh, formal and informal you is, is something. So there also the, the, the titling of people is, is different. So I have uh, added a sensei here and there um, to show a relationship that in German can be conveyed uh, with the way uh, the characters address each other. Um, and also there's always a question of how much locale to include in the translation. And for um, the US readers, uh, since we have a different, you, you know, um, we, we have a, a different um, makeup of where it's, it's, there's a, there, there are a lot of uh, Japanese Americans. We, ha we, we have different connections to, to Japan. Um, and so we're, there are some things that are perhaps more easily accessible to us and would, would sound more exotic perhaps in German. Um, but also 
there are certain things that Christina uh, Bunica has included some uh, Austrian dialect uh, in a couple words here and there, and I, I, that's hard to render. I didn't switch, uh, I didn't make those Japanese sayings. I just <laughs> tried to figure the, another way to say those. Um, but so it's more, it's, it's more finding a sensibility of how much of that Japanese um, to include um, uh, where, 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 where would it, a very judicious use of say the word uh, sensei. Uh, so I think that answers that one. Yeah. Yes, definitely. Mm -hmm. Um, Theodore Ma had sort of a similar question. Uh, he was saying that when he worked on uh, works from authors like Yoko Tawada and Selim, I'm going to mispronounce this, I'm sorry, Ozdagen, uh, mm -hmm. as part of an assignment for a course, um, he was struggling with how to handle the small tidbits of Japanese Turkish culture. And so he was wondering, how do you manage translating a novel that features languages and cultures beyond just German? Right, and because so it sort of adds yeah, on to that, yeah. Right, and the same with the French, the Charcot. I mean, the, like, there's a lot of description of Charcot, and um, w we as English speakers in 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 the U.S. Um, there's a familiarity with French terms embedded in 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 text. I mean, we we seem to have a uh, that's more. Uh, commonly found than say uh, Polish terms in a, in a, in a newspaper. But um, uh, so I can write, uh, I, I can put a French La Grande Hysterie and everyone knows exactly what it means because they, they, they it's, it's transparent. A Japanese word would not be transparent. Um, so it, there's a degree of transparency that also uh, can decide how much of that other uh, language to include in the, in the text. Uh, Anna for Anne first asks, has the book been translated into other languages? If so, do you know how those translation experiences compare to yours? The book has been translated, but I, Christina would have to answer how many because I can't remember and um, and I don't know I have not uh, I have not compared my translation to translations in my other languages that I would be able to read. But perhaps Christina can say how many. I can unmute you, Christina. <laughs> Are you there? Uh, here, here, we're, we're hearing, uh, I see that uh, French by Stéphanie Lux uh, is what Christine is writing and, it's, and she says that that translation is also wonderful. Great. Our next question is from Helen Zhang, who says, how do you detect, decipher, and differentiate the individual idiosyncratic voices in the German language and then transplant them into English? For, ins for instance, Goethe's German, Kafka's German, Bachmann's German, and Wernicke's German are all different from one another. Thoughts? Well, um, all those different Germans are, but also within, uh, within Bachmann, there's such a range depending on the book, uh, right? Um, so um, in all cases, th there's, There's a, an attempt to bring the book to the reader when, if whether it's Goethe or Bachmann or Christina Wunicke, we want the reader to have a certain experience. Now, it would be odd, I think, to translate Goethe with very uh, contemporary uh, vernacular. Um, Although, although I once was in a bookstore in New York, and by the way, we should also do a shout out to the independent bookstores uh, uh, <laughs> here in Houston, VA Brazos. Um, they, uh, and you can order this book from those bookstores. Um, but once I was in a bookstore, a very independent bookstore in New York, and I found a, a, a translation of, of uh, Rilke's uh, um, Duino Elegies, I think it was, and it was dedicated to the first test tube baby. And on the frontispiece, there was a, a naked man swinging through a jungle like tar. It was just, it was crazy. So um, I think those attempts sometimes are <laughs> interesting, but, but generally um, if we can somehow summon the time without getting trapped in language that is so 
uh, archaic that it, it would it would take us out of, of the book. So it's a real it's a real trick finding the age of the voice, and that's why I mentioned this this language from the uh, from my grandfather's uh, medical books. The just a hint. It's like it's like a spice, a hint of a, of a certain time, and can flavor the whole book. And so it's again calls for judicious use, I think. Um, uh, I sometimes ask my father, who is over 100 years old, um, if a certain phrase uh, was common in 1939, say. Um, and he'll say, oh yeah, we used to say that. And, uh, uh, and that's, that's an interesting <laughs> point of view for me uh, to have. Can I just add to that? Um, you mentioned that the questioner asked, uh, mentioned Kafka as one of the authors um, relevant to this question. And um, once an author becomes canonical, it has been translated multiple times. There are um, what you might think of as translation camps that evolve around different words. Um, uh, Kafka's metamorphosis has this uh, German word, ungeziefer, that can be translated any number of ways. It has been translated as cockroach, insect, and, and uh, bug, and, and whatever else. Uh, so you, um, in doing your translation, you're also aware that you're aligning yourself with or against um, established traditions uh, when, when dealing with canonical authors. So that's an additional wrinkle in this uh, in this puzzle of, of, of recreating the author's voice in English for well-established authors. Um, the next question is from Jennifer Jensen, uh, who says, thank you for sharing your translation of this fascinating book and congratulations. I wonder what advice you might have for young translators trying to break into the field, both professionally and aesthetically. Shelley, you wanna? <laughs> it's a question for both of you, I think. Yeah. Okay. Do you want me to jump in? I can. Um, so um, you want to have a piece placed somewhere that you have a, a publication record uh, to uh, go from, and um, and one one journal that's um, that's very welcoming um, of emerging translators that I would recommend to people looking to gain their footing uh, in German to English translation is called No Man's Land. Um, and in fact, one of the earlier questions from Jeffrey House, um, uh, he's one of the editors of that, of that journal um, that, that looked toward emerging translators. There were also competitions. Um, in fact, I've been on the jury of several of them uh, and I'm currently serving on some. Um, where we, um, we solicit translations of the same passage from, um, uh, uh, from tr emerging translators who are hoping to break into this field. And uh, winning that prize or a finalist status uh, gives you um, something to draw on when you approach publishers. A lot of this is word of mouth. It's a very um, puzzling process of how your name becomes a name to reckon with in the field. Uh, but you keep on trying and you can join groups, you can join Alter the American Literary Translators Association, go to their convention, not necessarily this year, uh, but in other years without the virus. Um, you can they, have a, they have a nice little uh, brochure, don't they, about how to break into? Uh, they do indeed. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the Penn Translation Committee in New York is wonderful in, as a as a gathering spot. There are little groups of translators who are now banding together. Um, there's one called Sedilla, uh, based in New York, although not all the translators live in New York in that group. Um, and they pool their expertise and, um, and, and mutual support to uh, find their way uh, into uh, a firmer footing in the, in the uh, field. There's, there's one called, I think, Starling Bureau in the UK, uh, and more and more of those are, are coming up, sort of grassroots organizations. Um, so I, I think those are some of the paths you might follow. I have, I have a question, thank you. Uh, I have a question for, from Icuna for Christina, actually. Um, 
So, uh, Dean, if you could unmute Christina. Um, the question is, why post-Meiji Japan? And do you see yourself in line with generations of Japanese writers who have tackle tackled similar topics, i.e. Soseski? Christina, are you there? Yes, hello. Oh, there we are. Yep. I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. I'm um, did, did you hear it or you didn't under, understand the question? No, I, I didn't understand uh, the, the first part of the sentence. Oh, okay. Why post Meiji Japan? And do you see yourself in line with generations of Japanese writers who have tackled similar topics? Why, why that? Why uh, the Meiji? 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 Ah, Meiji that ah, I didn't. I'm sorry. Yeah. Meiji. No, oh. no, sorry. Uh, maybe I'm mispronouncing it. I'm sorry. Yeah. Oh, well, it's, I don't see myself in the line of any uh, with with any Japanese authors at all. It's it's mostly it's more a book about Europe. I think from a like artificially Japanese perspective. It's not a book trying to emulate Japanese storytelling about Meiji restoration at all. Uh, and I'm, no, I don't, I don't see myself in the, in the line of, of Japanese literature at all, no. That would be crazy in a way. <laughs> I mean, I've, I've never been in Japan actually. It's, it's a, 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 it's a European view of a, Japanese dream about Europe or something. It's really very, uh, yes, <laughs> that's all I can say actually. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Um, let's see, we have one more question um, from Tracy Thibault. Um, and the question is, at, uh, Philip, I'm curious about how your work in the theater informs your work as a translator. What would you say are the primary differences or challenges in translating literary works versus translating a script for the stage? Well, when, <clears throat> when we're watching a play, uh, everything happens in time and we can't stop and go back and read reread the paragraph at all. So if there's something that's, that, that's, it, it, that's has to be conveyed, it really has to be, we only have one chance to, to see it. So the, and the speed of a, of a play is, is different. We can't, we, there's not the same room for rumination that there is in say a novel, although novels have their own speed as well. And the rhythm is so important in both cases. Uh, but in a play, sometimes we have to uh, jettison a little more so that the uh, ship can travel a little uh, faster or further. Um, it, there is a, a big overlap, I think, actually, um, when I'm directing a play, I'm going into the characters, I'm, env I'm envisioning a world, um, and there's a huge overlap between the directing, I think, and the translating, because for me anyway, and I also have to hear the voices of the characters that, uh, that are in the play, uh, whether I'm directing it or translating it, and I have to do the same for a novel. I, you have to hear this, you have to hear the voice in the original, and then in, you're, you're taking, in, a, in translating a novel, you're taking a, a text from one place and moving it to another place um, linguistically. And when I'm um, directing a play, I'm, I'm taking a text and moving it into another world. So there, there are all sorts of overlaps, but I, I find it that it, it very uh, uh, greatly informs my work uh, as a, a translator, the, the theater work does. I think that's a great way to end what has been a really interesting and wonderful conversation with the two of you. Um, thank you very much to, to you, Philip, and congrats for, for winning this year's prize for your insights. And to you, Shelley, for all of your great work with the prize and uh, your wonderful contribution today. Uh, thank you to everyone watching live. It, it's, a, it's a strange kind of you know, non-bodily presence through this uh, amorphous, yes. ineffable uh, internet experience. 
But it was great hearing from you, Christina, from Germany, and to hear from people all around the world really gives uh, a, a beautiful international perspective, which for uh, an event, for a subject like translation, I think uh, really makes a sense of community. So thank well, you th for- Thank you. I'd also like to, um, I know that uh, Barbara Epler just mentioned it, that there is this Penheim Translation Award and going to the Pen Club and finding out about that which also reminds me, um, um, I, one of uh, my uh, professors uh, was online here and I wanna do a shout out to Krishna Winston who is also a fabulous translator and who is, has mentored me and many others uh, in this. And so I think we owe a, a, a lot of thanks to the people who preceded us in, in, in translating. And, and we, I think that the, uh, continuing to uh, help all people who are interested in this work is a great thing. So thank you Goethe Institute for uh, encouraging all of this. So uh, to all of you, please stay healthy and well uh, and tune in to our uh, social media pages. We've got some interesting projects in the pipeline planned. Congrats. Thank you to you, Philip. Thank you, Shelley. And we'll see you next time. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye.